So thank you. Uh, well, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you all come here to see me, and I uh, hope uh, my talk will worth your time. So today I want to talk about the sort of eight common mistakes uh, for a new solution architect and how to avoid them. Uh, this is sort of my personal journey as well. So this is sort of the second sort of the series. So I did one talk last year on the North Shore.net meetup. I'll do the same talk tomorrow night at a, an Android meetup. So that talk is around how to um, um, <coughs> become a solution architect from a sort of a technical geek. So I am come from a bit development background and uh, before I wouldn't be able to sort of confidently stand here, present, and I was probably rather to put my headphone on, hide in the corner, and when people ask me, I'll sort of just not talk too much. <laughs> and what I find is that Mark mentioned about my podcast, so this is sort of what I learned from uh, my journey, and there isn't a lot of people sharing that, how you actually turn from a developer into a solution architect, because a lot of people want to do that, um, and a lot of um, architects are quite busy, and they, or they've been in the game for quite a long time, they've probably um, lost track of it, how they actually turn into a developer into an architect. So I only started to become a full architect about three years ago. So my sort of struggle and my experience are still quite relevant. So I'm, although I'm well known, but still pretty new into the game. Um, so, okay, so here's me, so you can add me on the LinkedIn and here's that, um, my podcast, which you can find it. Still add me on the LinkedIn, please. <laughs> so today's agenda is um, I want to share why um, I want to learn from the mistakes. Uh, you, you mentioned that I didn't say my mistake, which is a mistake. I'll explain that um, in the couple of slides. Um, I'll explain what are the eight common mistakes a new solution architect will make and how to grow yourself. I think that the key word is grow. How to grow yourself from these mistakes. So I guess why we, why we want to learn from mistakes is I think Albert Einstein sum up really, 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 really good. Is um, if you haven't made any mistakes, that means you haven't tried anything. If you actually listen to my podcast, I listened to it because there's a one that I did about a year ago around the eight common mistakes. Um, I feel a bit embarrassed because that was like um, I probably do much better now. But that's my MVP. That's my minimal viable product. I did it and I shipped it and. It's quite important that you have that content because nobody did it, and there's still about a um, hundred people listen to it, and this is at least have three downloads. I have another episode called "How to um, Become a Solution Architect," and that got about a um, thousand five hundred listeners. I didn't market it. I didn't really even talk about it because that's just my um, sort of personal ways of. Um, learning how to actually do a talk. Um, so I'm thinking, one of the things I'm thinking is just try something new. Uh, there's lots of ways you can do it and record it uh, and then just publish it. And I'm sure that mo there's definitely people will find your content interesting and give you feedback and that's the way you can grow yourself. Um, the reason I didn't say is my mistake is you don't really want to make all the mistakes yourself. <laughs> because that's really costly and, and that's not the... Um, although you grow from your mistakes, um, but at that time you made a mistake, the feeling is, is, is not that good. So you, you should learn from others. So I thankfully to have uh, two of my managers, one is Chris one and one is current one, to, I consider to be my mentor. So. Um, I don't have the normal manager and staff conversation. I have a really mentor and mentee conversation. I can share a lot of my personal struggle. And when my manager talks to me, he doesn't have to sort of um, have the fear that I'm going to record to an HR manager. So a lot of that conversation I had is very, very personal. And a lot of the things that um, is sort of tough on me, but I know that I, I've been quite honest with my manager. I want to grow. And uh, just don't treat me as a normal employee. You treat me as, as a person that really wants to grow in that role. And, and 
and really appreciate I get the same sort of treatment from a manager that really helped me to grow. Um, so let's get on the mistakes. So I didn't really put what the mistakes are. So mistake number one is talk too much. So when I first grow into that role, um, I'm thinking, oh, I'm the solution architect. I should know the solution. I should just go into the meeting and tell them this is the solution. Um, so this is so obviously people in this game for maybe even six months. You know, this is not the, the, the best way. Not probably probably the wrong way to, to do it. Um, I quite like one of the authors called John Maxwell. So I think his most famous book called Five Levels of Leadership. Um, in one of his uh, his talk, um, he's thinking uh, a as an advisor, so as a solution architect, you are the advisor, right? So to be really good at your job, you just need to be a bit more ignorant. So forget all the assumption, forget about all the things you you think you know. Just just empty your mind, basically. Just come in to ask questions, and there's there's quite a different framework around how you ask questions. Uh, one of them I follow is called Wiser Framework, W-I-S-A. So you ask, you come in to ask the vision, right? So what's your vision? What's the ideal outcome? And then um, you go on to sort of uh, ask for the kind of issues, um, why you have that project, and then you move on to solutioning. Uh, in the end is the, the action, especially your implementation step. It's sort of the target way, right? So you look at the future states and then you understand the current states. Then you, you understand the roadmap and then putting the implementation plan. So that's mistake number one is um, just shut up and <laughs> ask questions. Um, <coughs> mistake number two, <clears throat> thinking a solution architect as a decision maker. You're not a decision maker, you're the wiser. So all you need to do, so not all you need to do is you're not making decisions. That's the, that's, that's the key. You as an advisor, your role is identifying all the potential solutions and present it to the real decision makers. And you need to have a your view or your opinion around what's the best solution. But at the end of the day, you're not a decision maker. So you have to be quite objective around how you present things. You want to get you all the facts, get you all the constraints, report any risk. Um, to help the decision maker to make an informed decision. So, um, a lot of the new solution architect, when they get into role, thinking, okay, I'm the architect, I'm actually doing all the drawing, making all the calls. No, you need to sort of do up the mindset to change around. You're not the architect, you're not the decision maker, you are the trusted advisor, you provide the advice. So, you have to be. Um, so keep reminding yourself around that. Um, mistake number three is um, you're not talking to the real customer. I think this has happened for the new solution architect is when you get on the road, a lot of the projects that get handed over to you not going to be from the beginning. You're going to get it from somebody who may be at different stages of their project. You normally liaison with a project manager, a business analyst, um, or some other sort of stakeholders. You really need to understand who your real customer is and normally they won't tell you. So you do really need to sit down with your manager, especially when you come into a role, into a new organization, talk to your manager, talk to your buddy to really understand who your real customer is and then talk to the real customer. Because um, you, a lot of times that when they document the requirement or when they document all that stuff, Six months later, all of those are all changing. So we're, we're in a um, very fast-paced um, world, and agile seems to be um, sort of the best word. I don't want to quite use that word. Um, I think I talked to Mark around my opinion around agile. Um, but do talk to your real customer, ask that question. Um, um, one, another thing I would do is go to at least the first workshop um, when this project starts. If the PM doesn't want you to be there, just be persistent. Say, yeah, I just want to be there, even just listening. I can. I don't have to ask questions, I just want to listen what the real problem is. I think that's uh, quite a, a key thing for a solution architect to be successful in the project. It just You have to be there at the beginning, not when 
the requirement are being finalized because you never get the opportunity to actually ask the real customer. Because even your PM doesn't allow you to ask in the meeting, you know who your real customer is, just buy them a coffee and ask them. <laughs> uh, mistake number four, this is more of your personal development. I talk about this <clears throat> strictly from the technology perspective. I come from a Microsoft background and from development background, right? So when I step up into a solution architect, that's basically my view of the of the technology stack is Microsoft and development. So I don't really have a lot of um, understanding of sort of the infrastructure, security, and a lot of that sort of holistic view around um, how technology works. Um, as a solution architect, you are expect to really broaden your understanding of the technology. So if you really good at .NET, Dynamic CRM, I actually suggest you to go to some of the Amazon um, uh, sort of conference or learn a bit of Salesforce because um, as a solution architect, as a manager, you are a trusted advisor. So you need to be able to sort of um, have that broad understanding of that sort of stack, then be able to sort of brainstorm all the possible solutions. If all you understand is Microsoft or maybe Salesforce, maybe or maybe IBM, then all your solution is quite technology driven. We always mention about what should be customer driven, what should be sort of understand the business. But if you don't really have that skill set to really match up, then uh, in your mind or deep down, you still technology driven because that's where you feel comfortable that you are sure that this can be implemented. Because I'm, I'm, I'm sure that um, as a solution architect, we still need to provide a working solution. If you don't really have that confidence around some of the other technology, then uh, all what I see is you try to avoid them. And sometimes it could be a bad thing. <clears throat> Mistake number five. Um, solution architect is known as a technology leader. So be a leader, not a boss. <laughs> Um, what I mean is, um, I mentioned John Maxwell's quote, Five Level of Leadership. I quite like one of his quotes is, a leader is a, uh, is a tour guide, it's not a travel agent. That means, as a leader, you don't send your people to do stuff that you haven't done it before. You actually have uh, been there and done that before, and you show them this is how it can be done. So that's reflective when you as a solution architect in the, when you're doing a design, you really need to understand how everything fits together. If you there's any gap, you just consult with the subject matter expert. You really need to show that this is not just a high level design to present it to some, some sort of theory <coughs> to get approval. This is supposed to be a design that the delivery team can pick up and start implementing. So, um, be a leader. There's probably a broad um, topic around that. I'll just pick up on that specific thing around the design. So don't really leave in the ivory tower. Make sure your design is implementable. So I do see um, designs that in the past that they get approved, but they just can't implement it. Mm -hmm. so it's cost so much to implement it because they haven't really consulted with the right people. Um, <coughs> mistake number six is uh, I put the R to saying no, so don't say no. You, as a solution architect, your title uh, is provide solution. Um, uh, I sometimes refer my, my role as professional problem solver because my wife doesn't really understand my role because she studied uh, to be a real architect and she asked me, how come you have an architect in your role but you're not a real architect? It took me six months to explain to her I'm a professional problem solver and now she gets it. So how can you say no without saying no is you risk the risk. If somebody asks you to do something, instead of saying no, you say, yep, I, um, if you go down this path, here's the risk. Are you happy to accept those risks? You, you essentially, instead of making that decision to say, no, you can't do it this way, turn your mindset from a decision maker to advisor. Yes, you can do this, but here's the risk. Are you willing to accept? 
So here's the here's sort of turning your mindset around it. So just raise that risk. Make sure that you give enough information for the decision maker to make that to make that call. <clears throat> number seven, and the number seven and number eight is something I personally see working on. Um, <laughs> I'm not a calm person, so I got fired up very easily. Um, as my current manager tells me, then you you just got too many buttons on your body. And we, don't, we don't even know. <laughs> we don't even know. We, we've been pretty careful around not to press it, but it just you got too many. <laughs> um, so this is, I do went through, through a lot of training, so there's a way that you can handle objections, there's a way that you can um, sort of handle some difficult people. If you don't really know, I suggest you to go through some training. So I'll give you one example, right, this is, I'll give you two actually. One of them is, if people criticize your work, um, there's a way to handle it. Um, for example, if say, Mark, really my high level design, and then he talk to me to say, Hey Ben, your high level design sucks because you use point to point integration and in fact you don't even use integration, you use bloody CSV files. And I think that the first thing you do to be professional is you don't answer that question or you don't like, in a way, is, um, the training, the trainer told me is essentially somebody tried to punch you, so you don't punch the back. So what you do is, uh, I think in Japanese there's a sport called Aikido. So instead of push it back, you, you pull it. In China we call it Tai Chi, so you pull it. So what you put in that conversation is, you don't um, voice your objection back. You label his emotion, right? So I can say, Mark, you seem to be really upset. And then you pause. Because, because the, the way that they're criticizing you is not you don't really understand why they criticize you, right? So they, they might set, set it's because you're highly designed. But it might be just he just had a bad day. He might have got his design declined. Or you don't really know. So you just label that, label his emotion, and he will open up. And you, you, you can use another technique called mirroring. Mark may say, yeah, your design sucks because this, is, this, this, this hasn't used the, you use the quantum quantum integration. Then what you need to do is you mirror that. You say quantum point integration. Then he will open up even more. To say, yeah, you in our organization, the standard is you don't use point to point. You have to use middleware. And then you can say, oh, I don't really, love, I don't realize that. How can I help? How, can you help me to make it better? So you're basically using Akito to pull that person. So you don't really, um, you don't really have a fight. Another way that I use. Um, is that broadcast? Yep. <laughs> How you use my wife is um, <laughs> don't, don't answer don't answer the question. You can use you can use it to be honest. So when your spouse um, criticizing you, don't answer or ask you a question. Don't answer that question. Label their emotion. So my wife would say, "Hey, been you always in the office? You ne you never be here with with me and, and my kids." You don't try to explain why you you, you you not be here. Not at, at least not at the beginning. You lay your mm -hmm. emotion. You say you seem to be really upset, and then pause. The same thing, right? So using Akito. That's a really good technique. If you if you don't really know um, how to do it, Google it, and there's probably a few uh, YouTube videos around it, and there's a lot of training around that. Just this 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 something I'm still working on. Uh, um, although I mentioned that. Um, most of the time, I still try to push it back. So, it, it, but at, at least you need to know the, the skill set and then have some self awareness. And then you try to do Aikido or Tai Chi or, uh, all the time. Then you'll be, you'll be sweet. Be professional. This is professional way of handling criticism. Um, <clears throat> mistake number eight. I think this is the talk Malcolm will, will do. So, I'll just touch on it. It's the, um, stakeholder management, uh, which I, uh, my manager called that, then you really need to engage with all the stakeholders. Um, <coughs> stakeholder engagement, what I originally thought is, oh, I just had a coffee, or oh, I just have a meeting with different stakeholders and I'll be fine. 
But no, it's not that. It's you need to, especially if you're not a contractor or even you are a contractor, <coughs> you need to build some personal relationship with that with that person. When you are successful at stakeholder engagement is when you make a mistake or when you about to fail, that stakeholder actually stand up for you to say, hey, you <coughs> made a mistake, but I understand. Um, here's here's what it did. And he's actually willing to support you, not try to sort of kick you at the back. When you're having that relationship, that's when you have a true stakeholder engagement. That's for me to work on this year. Um, yeah, that's sort of the eight common mistakes. Um, that's sort of my personal philosophy. You can see a lot of that mistake I made personally. Pretty much all of them, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my philosophy that um, I, I can accept failure. I, I just talk to my um, my sort of senior management team quite openly. So I'm still young. I'm willing to make a mistake. Uh, I'll probably will be. Uh, but just let me know. Put me on the side if I lost lost myself and get me back on track, which mm -hmm. they did, which I um, really appreciate um, all your help. <clears throat> Another thing I touch on is finding a mentor. Um, I couldn't find that nice picture. That's one I read in, in a book. So trial and error, yes, um, it, it can uh, it can work. But if you can learn from other people's mistakes, for example, today I share sort of my personal mistake. If you can learn from that, you are your starting point is is a, is a very different level. Uh, here I've got some of the books that um, I sort of read and, and, and get touched on. And, uh, and this is my virtual mentor, um, Jim Rome. So he passed away, I think about five, five or six years ago. So I quite like his philosophy. Um, that's what I personally try to follow is work hard on yourself. Than do, you do on, on your job. If you work hard on your job, you can make a living. <coughs> if you work hard on yourself, you can make a fortune. And income seldom income seldom exceeds personal development. So personal development is a big thing, and that's what I'm working on all the time. <coughs>